The breakup of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s created a major economic crisis in Cuba known as the Special Period. So we have from 1989 to 1992, 1993, a free fall of the economy to of 34% of GDP, gross domestic product. When I tell you free fall of the economy, trying to imagine an airplane suddenly lose their engines. It was really a crash. Cuba lost 80% of its export and import markets. Oil imports dropped by more than half. Buses stopped running, factories closed, electricity blackouts were common, and food was scarce. People almost starved. In reality, when this all began, it was a necessity. People had to start cultivating vegetables wherever they could. Over the next decade, Cuba took drastic steps to find solutions. It is the first country to face the crisis that we will all face, the peak oil crisis. Almost overnight, $750 million worth of food and medical supplies to Cuba were halted. A few years later, the embargo was intensified, and foreign businesses working in Cuba were barred from entering the U.S. Cuba's access to foreign capital was crippled. An American dollar reached 150 pesos, and, and, and the average salary is, is like two pesos. No? There were people that were making two bucks a month. So money was not useful to, to get stuff. So we end up being like an experiment, no? like with control conditions. Like, Nothing or very little things can get from the outside, so everything has to happen from the inside. Every aspect of Cuban life was affected by the special period, but no change was as far-reaching as agriculture. Cuba had committed to the Green Revolution, a system which requires the massive use of fossil fuels in the form of natural gas-based fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, and diesel fuel for tractors and other farm machinery. Cuba's agriculture began to falter as one problem after another halted production. Fuel and parts for tractors were almost impossible to find. Seeds, tools, animal feed and vaccines were scarce. The lack of fuel uh, drove us to have a very ch big shortage of food. So people, they end up squatting places in the city and growing food there. Without knowing how, because there were engineers, there were doctors, there was not farmers. A drastic effort to convert every piece of arable land to organic agriculture was begun. Another thing during the special period was the identification of idle plots of land, right, that were cleaned up by the community and turned into uh, agricultural gardens, urban agricultural gardens. Hearing of the crisis, Australian permaculture experts came to Cuba to assist in developing new ways to garden and raise food. So in October of 1993, the first two Australians came. And so we started to design the rooftop garden in that place. And we started to do a train-the-trainer course. The neighbors are starting to see the possibilities of what they can do in their spaces. And they're starting to create uh, uh, natural gardens on their roofs and also in their patios. Cubans, who formerly lived on the equivalent of just $2 a month, found new ways to supplement their income. These grapevines have a lot of uses. It provides shade, so you have a little patio area. You also can make wine out of the grapes, and, and it's very good for the family economy, because if you do it well, you can get about 10 pesos for, um, for a bottle of wine. Cubans' view of agriculture has changed dramatically. Farmers are now among the highest paid workers, and people from all fields are attracted to the profession. With a very low cost, we were producing food, and now we have more than 1,000 kiosks allocated in the city that provide you with fresh fruits and vegetables produced in the neighborhood. More than 50% of the total vegetable needs of the Havana's population, 2.2 million inhabitants, is supplied by the urban agriculture. In small cities and towns, urban gardens are even more productive, providing 80 to 100 percent of the fruits and vegetables they need. Urban agriculture supplies food locally, eliminating much of the need for transporting food over long distances. The, the country has 169 municipalities. So five kilometers around the municipal towns also are considered urban agriculture. So it's a national system that is employing 
more than 140,000 people, actually. It's creating jobs. It's a growing sector of the economy. And it is very important. And we're very proud to say that. Fortunately, research centers had begun studying sustainable agriculture before the crisis. Because of this preparation, the transition to an approach to farming that didn't depend on fossil fuels was implemented nationally within just a few years. Without fossil fuels, more manual labor was needed, making smaller farms necessary and increasing the number of farmers. The soil is a, is a, is a living being. And in the top soil, in the first three inches of soil, is the key. You add chemicals, you damage all of that. So then the soils became almost like sand. Cuba found that it took from three to five years to make the land fertile and productive again. Organic needs a transition, no? needs some time and needs some money to establish the system because when you get the soil, the soil is so damaged and dead that you need to, to rebuild the soil. You need to bring back the soil to life. You have to follow the natural cycles. So you hire nature to work for you, not work against nature. To work against nature, you have to waste huge amounts of energy Conventional people use this heavy machinery that compacts the soil, huge tractor, huge combined trucks and things like that. So you have to, to open the soil again, add more nutrients. The first ethic, to take care of the land, of the earth. This is very important. If we don't take care of the, of the earth, earth will take care of us and get rid of us. Cuba's new agriculture uses a variety of soil-enhancing alternatives to rebuild and maintain the soil. Crop rotation, composting, and green manure, which is a process of plowing young vegetation into the soil. Many tons of organic compost are produced, using kitchen scraps, rice hulls, and other organic matter. Worm humus is made in long troughs, where worms are fed organic waste products. This makes a richer fertilizer than regular compost. Today, 80% of Cuba's agricultural production is organic. The lack of fuel drove us to use less machinery, to go to smaller farms, to combine different crops in one small piece of land, preventing pets spreading. We developed many biopesticides and many biofertilizers Today we are even exporting to Central American countries and other Latin American countries we are exporting biopesticides and biofertilizers. Remember Cuba has one advantage. If the Cuba population of Cuba is 2% of the population in Latin America, Cuba has 11% of all the scientists in Latin America. It's difficult to grow certain crops in Cuba's heat so farmers use a variety of mesh covers to cut the sun's rays. We can extend the season and just using something as simple as putting uh, a fabric, a porous fabric over a simple structure that you can remove when a hurricane is coming and you can uh, build again. It's very simple. And this fabric also allows you to control the pest because you not only reduce the radiation, and the heat, but you also reduce the number of bugs entering into the area. In the 80s, in Cuba, we used 21,000 tons of pesticides, chemical pesticides. Now, it's 1,000. We are using 21 times less pesticides. This is good for the environment, this is good for the health, and this is also good for the soil. Cuba uses crop interplanting to reduce the need for pesticides and make their agriculture more sustainable. Nobody fertilizes a forest and nobody irrigates a forest. The forest do by itself. So if you are able to create like something like a food forest, your main effort is like pick the fruits and pick the produce. And, uh, so in that way, the effort is less. You work hard in the very beginning, but once the system is established, uh, you work a lot less. It's what we call lazy people agriculture, but it's because you are working with nature, not against nature. These people in the conventional system work against the nature.
To increase food production, the government worked with farmers to find local solutions. The result was smaller farms and cooperatives with a high degree of privatization and autonomy. Forty percent of the large state farms were divided into privately owned cooperatives. Tens of thousands of acres of land were leased rent-free to small farmers. Decision-making was localized with fewer state regulations. Two requirements. You grow things there. You, if you don't grow things there, we take you the place from, away from you and give it to somebody else. To 50% of the total arable land is in private hands in Cuba. So these are the, the private farmers. They are by far the highest production per acre and per person. These new private farms and co-ops also began to function in new ways. But we have credit and services co-ops. What does that mean? You don't want to join your lands with me? We don't. So we are together in the co-op for credits, to buy the seeds together, to, to, to hire the machinery for this stuff. But we don't have to join their land. So it's a way of decentralized, but centralized at, at the same time. Thousands of families moved to rural land. With land rights guaranteed, a sense of ownership led to greater productivity. Private farmers markets and new export markets led to greater production. The communities have changed. It's a local economy. People were exchanging things. Many of these gardens, they supply for free food to elder people's circles, daycare centers, uh, schools, working centers, pregnant women. Uh, and they do it for free. And they don't do it because it's compulsory. They do it because they want it. They want to do their little part to, do, to the society. It would not the door and say, I need some salt. I need some sugar, whatever. I brought you an avocado. No? <laughs> and recover this, this sense of neighbor. It, it, for me, it's not going backwards. Well, the average Cuban consumes less than one-eighth the energy of the average American. Overall, the economic crisis improved Cubans' health. Increased walking and biking reduced diabetes and the number of heart attacks and strokes. The Cuban diet changed. Fat consumption was reduced, while more vegetables and a wider variety of vegetables were eaten. Before, Cubans didn't eat that much vegetables because they, they eat more tubers, for example, cassava, taro, potato, but rice and beans and pork meat was basic, the, the basic diet, no? the national food or whatever. And they say that the rest of the things, with the exception of maybe tomato and lettuce and a little bit of cabbage, were weeds. So at some point, necessity teach them. And now they demand it. So there are infinite small solutions. You fix one little problem here, one little problem there, and life is better. You think globally, you act locally. People have to start from scratch and start to do small things, baby steps. Crisis or changes or problems can trigger uh, many of these things that these are uh, sustainable, alternative, whatever it's called, but it's basically adapting. We are adapting to changes, and that's the success of the human beings. I think we can learn a lot from each other and reflect more on how to be happy with less and how you really don't need that much. Uh, you know, to, to be happy. I think that that's a challenge, a world challenge. Cuba has modest uh, experience that, you know, maybe some other people could learn from. And I think it will be a time for sharing, a time for cooperation, and a time for more solidarity and for working together. I think maybe we'll have a better world.